evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. 89.3 Mahoning Drive-In Radio. It's your old friend Virgil back once again with my co-hosts, Mark and Jeff in the house, the trifecta. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. We're uh, we're coming off of an insane weekend and really an insane start to the season. Uh, for those of you guys that don't know, we did open up a month early. And uh, boy, oh boy, it was the shot in the arm that we were looking for as far as just giving us that nice jump start. Uh, last weekend, we had the wild world of David Lynch, which was a sellout event both uh, Friday and Saturday. And it was madness, right, guys? Absolutely. It was based on our record since we've been doing the retro thing. As far as we know, the largest number of people on the lot since, what, 2014 and 2015? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. We had capped the tickets at, what was it, 650 for this show? Correct. And previously, uh, in, 2000, in 2020, we had capped a sellout at 600. And that was a little, a little below what we believe the number was for our first ever sold out show, or when we felt like it wasn't safe to let another person or car on the lot for Camp Blood a couple of years ago. So as you know, COVID is, is hopefully waning. We're, we're bumping those numbers up a little bit and allowing more people on the lot. And uh, yeah, we sold out that Saturday for Lynch, which I think the Twin Peaks was the big draw, the Twin Peaks actors and, and Fire Walk With Me on 35. That sold out very quickly. Friday of Lynch, which was Eraserhead in Blue Velvet with uh, Charlotte Stewart, who was one of the stars, plays the mother of the baby in Eraserhead. Um, that sold out, I think, just a few days before the show. And then our Sunday show um, was healthy for a Sunday. That was a 35 presentation of Dune. And that was like 250 or so people, I think. Easily, yeah, a little over. And we had, you know, every, it was an all hands on deck weekend. We had all of our staff there uh, working, you know, from about four ish until the wee hours every night. And uh, boy, do my feet hurt, as I said earlier. Yeah, we had the, the Q&A tied in. Um, we had multiple guests on Saturday. We ended up having five guests because we had a secret special appearance on Saturday. And it was just a wave. You know, Jeff Jeff can speak on it. When did the films end on Friday and Saturday? Oh, my goodness. Like, uh, I think like one in the morning, something like that. Yeah, maybe even two, I think, on one night. Yeah, I think I think it was for sure. But it was amazing. We have to give a huge shout out to Faye Merman. We're going to do a standalone kind of wrap up podcast with Faye. Uh, her fandom certainly revolves around Twin Peaks and a lot of other things, too. She was actually responsible for our Mad Max weekend last year, which ironically was our first sellout of last season as well. So it's really great. I was telling the guys and the whole team. This is the type of event that just goes viral. Everybody is sharing it because they're having such a great time. And it really gives the season a beautiful uh, shot in the arm as far as people shining a light on it. And now it's on a ton of people's radar for them to come back for Zombie Fest and a lot of our other big events that we got coming up. So it's uh, it's really exciting. But Faye um, went out of her way to lock in all these crazy photo ops, these guests organized this secret special guest um, who ended up being Rebecca Del Rio. Um, she came on the lot and sang uh, with our band, F.U. Tammy, who is a David Lynch cover act. And it was mind bending. We had people coming up to us all weekend saying, this is the first time I've been out of my house in a year. This is my first big event that I've been to since COVID. It feels so safe. You guys do such an amazing job. It was a wave of love, and people were coming from all over the country for this one. And that's yeah. not, it may sound like it, but it's not narcissism on our part. I mean, we get so many people who come up to us and thank us for what we do and post online how it's making their dreams come true. And it's insanely humbling. And I always make sure to share that with the staff to let them, and I actually sent a message internally today saying, no matter what you do here, whether you're picking up trash or handing somebody French fries, 
you're you're making somebody's night and you may be literally helping make somebody's dream come true by coming here because these are people who have come from all over the country. We had somebody fly out from Seattle. I think he, he was, he was with us all week. He was for wild at heart on Tuesday. He was here all weekend and he's coming back for zombie fest because the programming is so unique. And like so many of our shows, people often say, I wish somebody would do this closer to me. And I always try to as gently as possible say, don't don't wait forever for that to happen <laughs> because, <laughs> because I used to say that. And I, that's why I came to the Mahoning for the first time because no other place anywhere near me was doing anything like that. And unless you can make it happen yourself, which sometimes is possible if you have a local indie or an art house theater who's open to you know working with an outside group, unless you make it happen yourself, you need to go where the action is. And you know the action is the new Be Beverly and it's at an Alamo draft house and it's at the Mahoning drive-in. You, you, you kind of have to go where it is, you know? Absolutely. Exactly. Most places equipment wise can't do it. And the prints we had this weekend were gorgeous. It was unreal. Unbelievable. These all came from all but one. Dune was universal, but Eraserhead, Blue Velvet and Fire Walk With Me all came from Janus Films, which is attached to the Criterion Collection. And I have to imagine that they just won't have a print if it's not in really good shape but everybody was just stunned at how beautiful those looked on the big screen. I had a buddy who came in from Maryland. He's there pretty often, my buddy Seth. And he turned to me, he's like, is Eraserhead digital tonight? I was like, oh no, this is literally one of the most flawless prints that we've ever had up on that. It just, it looked incredible, you know? And it's, it's really speaks to the format and when we're all firing on all cylinders, the weekend just went gloriously, even with the insane amount of hurdles that we had to jump internally. I said it, you know, when I, I got into this biz with Jeff, I didn't think I would be booking hotels, booking flights, working out schedules for drivers, blah, blah, blah. But it's like it's all become part of what we do. And now I think what people expect of the Mahoning, you know, James makes a really great point every time that he uh, pitches us an idea for a photo op, he says, I'm not half-assing anything, regardless of the turnout, because this is something that people expect of the Mahoning. It's part of our show, part of our appeal. And he's right. I mean, the amount of red room pictures that went out, it's incredible. And I'm so proud of the team um, when, we, when it comes to these humongous events where we all have to pull together to make it happen. And then it ends up being such a smashing success, you know? And you and I said that as as the band was playing, uh, which was, they were amazing playing under our screen. And if you look up on social media, find, you know, our feed or, or their, the FU Tammy feed, you can see some pictures of them playing under the big screen. But we just looked at each other and we were like, every single person on our team killed it tonight. And it's running as smoothly as a Tuesday. And what we mean by that is Tuesdays are usually a more light attendance because not as many people can make it out. And it was it was so smooth. It was it was crazy. We had a lot of hurdles, like I said, and a lot of different setups as far as on screen stuff, um, as far as the band, as far as logistics. And it just went so smooth, you know, not a complaint, not a single uh, issue. It was just all love all weekend. And I think it really does speak to what we offer at the Mahoning and how appreciative people are after, you know, kind of coming out of the wave of this pandemic. I think we're really in for a year of that, of people who are just so ready to kind of get out and have an experience that that love just, it's going to keep on coming. I can feel it. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, Jeff, when when you started this 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 phase of the operation, did you ever think you would be playing a green room host to our celebrity guests? Because they all seem to work their way into that chair next to your next to your desk to just hang out during the movies. I know it's funny. They love that chair. It's, it's right next to my desk. And yeah, Rebecca Del Rio sat there and talked to me for um, like an hour in between what she was doing outside. And uh, it was a lot of fun. She was telling me things about the movie and David Lynch, and it was just great. So it's nice when they come into the booth because they, I actually have time to sit down and talk to them between reels. I mean, not for, you know, maybe 15 minutes at a time, but then change a reel, go back, talk for another 15 minutes. So it adds up to an hour or so, and uh, it was very informative. And what I loved viewing it, I didn't want to, 
I didn't want to, you know, ruin the moment or or impose. But when Andre Gower was there for our uh, Monster Squad weekend, it was so much fun to watch and, and join in the discussion you guys were having of just classic film and classic film actors and, and Humphrey Bogart and stuff like that. Yeah, you're right. Everything from Humphrey Bogart to uh, Clark Gable and, you know, movies from the 40s, 50s and up. And yeah, it was great. And he, Andre Gower was such a nice guy. Great guy. Yeah, we've been very lucky with our guests and we have a lot of guests scheduled for this season. And uh, we've been very lucky. We work with amazing bookers um, and we had a point where every single booker this weekend came up and handler came up and said, this is honestly the greatest show that our guests have ever been at. And just as far as, um, you know, the love, the turnout and all that stuff, it, it's just amazing. So I can say my my favorite moment of the weekend, without a doubt, uh, happened on Saturday night. And again, it's these unscripted moments that happen that you could never plan on. It's not part of the show, but the entire cast gathered in the 35 millimeter booth during Fire Walk with me. Um, before they left, we wanted to make sure that our crew had a chance to get pictures with them. Um, which we had, they were super gracious uh, to give us a bunch of group photos and single photos. But uh, perfect timing. Um, Robert is working on the changeover for uh, one of the reels in Fire Walk with me. And all the guests are in there just gobsmacked at, you know, only 35 millimeter drive in what we do looking at this equipment that's still running. It's they're sucked up in it. You could really tell. But as that changeover is approaching, they're all eyes on Robert, you know, and uh, this changeover. So he hits that changeover and the roar of applause that came out of that booth just echoed throughout the concession stand. And it's it's moments like that that just like give me chills, you know, because these are people who are in the movie, have been in the industry for years. I mean, Charlotte is how old? I, I think 80 years old, correct? Just turned 80, yeah recently so that's somebody who's been you know in this business forever and you know to see people still get so excited about what we do is just a reminder of how important what we do is and i made a point to go up to robert uh at the end of the night and pat him on the back and be like well if that ain't a stamp of approval <laughs> i don't know what is you know so it was, it was just a, a really great great moment yes it was and if anybody is, is you know, tuning in late and hasn't listened to our earlier shows or hasn't visited the theater, um, if you have seen the documentary at the drive-in directed by Alexandra Minnelli, available now for streaming on Amazon Prime and on DVD from MBDA Entertainment, uh, <laughs> Rob started as just a regular, like a lot of us did. He was somebody who liked the programming and came to the theater all the time. And then he started volunteering and he worked in the snack bar. And then this season he is training to project so he's sort of the assistant project she is the assistant projectionist this season and he's been training you know every show since we've opened and he's you know i think he had done projecting previously in his life on a platter system at an indoor theater but never reel to reel and changeovers so um he's got a great attention to detail cares very much about the presentation and is generally right on top of things so um it, it's exciting to see him get that kind of recognition you know, not very far into the gig, so to speak. I agree. He uh, he learned from me uh, very quickly. I was surprised how fast he picked it up. Now, you're right. He's been doing it since the opening of the season, and there's still a few things I have to teach him yet, but uh, he's coming along very quickly, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm, I'm very happy. I only have to remind him about a couple of small things, and it's um, I'm very pleased with his progress. Yeah, it's incredible. I made a point and he made a point to say this weekend that it doesn't matter what gets thrown at him. This is what makes him happy. This is where he loves to be. This operation is where his heart is. And I say it all the time, like he's meant to be in a booth. That attention to detail is something that is, uh, you know, not everybody would put that amount of of love and concern into the program or uh, presentation. But Jess told me he watches every single movie before a screening to make sure he kind of knows where the movie's heading, where a cue mark may be, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's an amazing thing to see. And that's that really goes for every person on our team 
as far as taking this uh, above and beyond. You know, we have raised the bar in such a huge way on the lot, in concession, up on screen, with merch, with everything. It's just, it's incredible. And, you know, the again, coming from the fans, they see it. The people who have been with us uh, since we went retro, they said, man, going from a couple cars to now upgrading your systems, upgrading your lot, upgrading your... People are now seeing it, that their um, love for this place and patronage to this place is uh, coming back, you know, uh, to them as far as uh, the presentation and, and lot and everything else goes. Hot popcorn, just pop. Oh, and two bags of those peculiar white puppy material. Uh, you mean our crunchy popcorn. Popcorn, rich with hot melted butter. And uh, people who follow us online would already know this, but we just got a new popcorn machine this week, just the other day. We did. Literally, the girls were jumping for joy. The, the, the girls in the concession stand. I have the greatest video of the first pop. And they are, like, giddy. <laughs> and the old machine was was functional. It's just that it, some, some internal piece had, had worn out. And I know it, it just couldn't keep up on the busier nights from what I was told. Well, and it wasn't it wasn't popping correctly anymore. Uh, kernels were only getting like half popped. And uh, I could see by the number of uh, even kernels didn't pop at all. Some of them I could see by the amount of seed and stuff in, in the popcorn that it was just it had reached its last legs. It was 20 years old and the kettle wasn't heating up hot enough to pop correctly. And that's what, you know, drove me to think, you know, there's no sense. And they even found a replacement kettle. We could have gotten one and put it in there. And when we got it years ago, it was already used. We didn't buy that one brand new. That was used when we got it. And it hadn't been taken care of to begin with. So the fact that it was wearing out didn't surprise me one bit. So uh, I looked at Virginal. I said, I'm, I'm going to get a new one. I said, there's no point putting a $1,500 kettle into a 20-year-old machine and then have something else go wrong. So I said, we're going to get a new one. And uh, right. that's what we did. And it's beautiful. Uh, you should see the kernels now. They're fat. I mean, they pop completely. And I know the kids. I know the staff we have. I know Beth. Uh, they're going to keep that thing looking brand new for a long time to come. What was the brand? Is it the same brand uh, machine as what we just replaced, the new one? Yeah, it's a gold medal. Yeah. A pop o -matic is what the... Uh... Yeah. I guess it's officially called, but gold metal is uh, who supplied it to us. And it was a to do to get it here. I wish that they could have gotten pictures of this thing traveling because supposedly they created it um, in Kansas city. I think they said, and then it was shipped to their warehouses. And then from there it was shipped uh, to PA to gold metals place. And then to us. So when it showed up, it was just like, wow, this is literally the exact same machine. The only difference right. is um, we do have a pump-up system now. When I say that, it pump-up system means the oil is pumped up from the bottom to the top of the kettle. What we had before was like a canister system where you have a big canister of oil and then there's like a machine pump that goes into the canister. But now we'll be using uh, what a lot of indoor theaters and theaters in general use, which is bladder bags filled with oil, which is a much easier process, much cleaner process. So we're really, really excited to uh, to make that shift. But Jeff put it perfectly. I mean, that when we came in in 2014, that kettle was hella used. And, you know, we did our best to uh, maintain it for what it was. And I always said, like, People said, wow, what gives the Mahoning, the, that, the popcorn, that flavor? I said, well, 20 years of lived-in flavor in that kettle. <laughs> flavor patina. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's almost like a Dutch oven. It builds up a coating and, you know, it, it made very good popcorn, but it made it very poorly. That was the problem. Yeah, it was. It just it, over time, it just slowly started to, uh, to, to give up as far as the amount it would pop how quickly it would pop. And when we were in there doing the demo with uh, with the guys, they said, your first pop will take about four minutes after that, two and a half. And me and Beth <laughs> looked at each other and like, we're just like, this is such a game changer. So that's the beautiful thing again, is 
we're well beyond the couple cars on the lot. We're, we're hosting humongous sellout events and, you know, having the equipment that can keep up is, is pretty essential, just like anything else. So it's a, it's a really great, great investment for us and something that really, really excites the entire crew. Even people who have nothing to do with concession are super excited that we have beautiful fat pop kernels. <laughs> exactly, exactly. In the year 2000, you won't need Boy Scouts to help you cross the street. You'll need an armed guard. The traffic is murder in Death Race 2000. Starring David Carradine. I was brought up in a government training center to be just what I am. The best driver on earth. Death Race 2000. The cars of the future in a cross-country road wreck. Death Race 2000. A new world picture rated R under 17, not admitted without parent. MGM presents the first motion picture of the 23rd century. Logan's Run. Just imagine the fulfillment of every fantasy. Run, Logan. The absolute attainment of every wish. Run, Logan! There's just one catch. Run, Logan! Logan's Run. Rated BG. Parental guidance. Released by United Artists. Logan's Run. It's the perfect world of total pleasure. There's just one catch. Your attention, please. All new hotshot electric in-car heaters have been installed for your comfort and convenience. Just insert heater through car window and turn on the switch. When leaving, please turn switch off and replace on speaker post. Warning, high voltage. For your own safety, do not attempt to repair or remove wires. Do not attempt to open heater unit. If you need assistance, please notify the theater box office or concession manager. So we have some incredible shows coming up next weekend. You guys probably all know it if you're hearing this. Zombie Fest 7 returns this year. Um, it is extended. We have a Thursday screening of Dawn of the Dead with guests um, in tow. And uh, obviously Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are jam-packed. I've been telling people the low ticket alert is coming very soon. So don't hesitate. Jump on that. It's Memorial Day weekend. Um, it's always a staple for a lot of people. And uh, got to put it in there because we haven't pushed it too much. Hank's giving weekend coming up in the beginning of June, the 4th and the 5th. And we have League of Their Own and Sleepless in Seattle on 35 on Friday the 4th. And on Sunday, you guys have been asking for it like crazy. The Burbs and Money Pit both on 35. We're going to have a lot of fun with that. So we hope you guys can make it out. But I got to mention... Um, the return of Spaghetti Sunday is coming back in June as well with for a few dollars more. That'll be the Sunday after Thanksgiving on the 6th. I guess our Patreon folks know this and probably most of our fans know this because we weren't really quiet about it. Um, we did have to cancel a show. Unfortunately, we got word from Disney that the print of Escape to Witch Mountain was not in the greatest of shape when they pulled it out and did their inspection. Unfortunately, we had already announced it, but they came back to us and said that it was graded at a round of four and they weren't really comfortable sending a grade four print to the theater. They know, you know what the Mahoning is. The last thing they want to do is send a print that's going to damage um, uh, the equipment or give a subpar um, show. So that's kind of a nice snowball. I guess we can talk a little bit about film stock and kind of what we're dealing with with certain studios with kind of restruck prints versus original prints versus prints that were struck before a certain time. What we've been dealing with with Disney for our first weekend that we did with them for Return to Oz and Watcher in the Woods, they were original Eastman color prints because they came out before, gosh, I want to say it was 82. I could be wrong on that. Return to Oz was an original release print, but it looked great because that was 1985. Yes, it, it looked gorgeous. It really A did. A few spicks and specs, but to me, it did, in my mind, it did not look any worse than it would have if I was seeing that at a drive-in, maybe at the very tail end of its run. Because, you know, fil most film prints pick up a little visual history as they move from uh, town to town, up and down the dial. But what we have heard is a lot of the Disney prints, as you were starting to say, but before a certain era, are Eastman color, which is known to, to not retain its color very well. 
Um, and I, I did want to jump in and say Escape to Witch Mountain was a film that I had picked because it was a film I loved as a kid. People my age really loved and remembered seeing. And um, it had sold no tickets before we pulled it <laughs> due to uh, not being have a, a print available. So then you came to me, Virgil, and you said, what would you like to see? And I said, I want to see a Herbie movie. So we looked at the list we were working from for Disney and they had two Herbie movies listed. They had the Lindsay Lohan Herbie movie, which I liked at the time. And they had uh, Herbie Goes Bananas, which was the oldest Herbie movie they, they had on their list. And I was like, well, we should go with an old one. And Herbie Goes Bananas from 1980 is actually one I saw at the drive-in when I was a kid. So there's a little nostalgia. Then we found out that they didn't have a quality print of Herbie Goes Bananas and we had only sold four tickets. So don't let the fact that the ticket sales were insanely low on the two Disney movies that I picked cast a sturgeon upon my ability to pick. <laughs> I, I'm going to say that ever. I'm going to go with sunspots. I'm going to go with continental drift and and perhaps harmonic convergence. I, maybe Halley's Comet came back around. I don't know why the ticket sales were low on those, but I still say that those are fun movies. Anyway, you were saying. Well, that's what we're going to be dealing with. And that's what we have been dealing with in general with working with Studio Prince. It is a situation where, you know, some studios more than others, they just don't restrike their prints. They're relying on their archive prints. Uh, their theater prints that have been running and, and rocking and rolling around the theater theater for years and decades even. And, uh, you know, sometimes they are amazing quality. Sometimes they are a little more worn. Sometimes they have a little pink to the color. And I always say it like that kind of adds to the fun and you never know what you're going to get kind of um, uh, experience that you get at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. Some you know, imperfection, imperfections don't always bother me. Occasionally you'll find a print that is red, like literally like you're wearing rose colored glasses. Like there's no color other than red or where the color is so faded. Like remember when we did a biker night, bike night years ago and we ran the Born Losers and that film had like, it was like almost no color at all. It was like, you're almost watching like line drawings of the people on a, on a white screen. It was really strange. So the, the, the issue with, uh, with Disney is that they very rarely, they have very strict rules for what kind of theaters can run repertory or for common person terms, old films from their vault. And it's, it's really, really strict rules. So very, very few theaters can run those. And if you add to that fact that very few, very few theaters can run film, period, the ones that can run film that can have access to the Disney vault are probably not reaching for the really obscure titles. And beyond that, Disney had a very robust reissue program from the 50s onward. When I was a kid, I was seeing the classics like Pinocchio, Mary Poppins, Aristocats. I was seeing movies that were 20, 30 years old on the big screen because they struck new prints and put them out there again after they stopped doing that. And that was really only for the biggest titles. So for a movie like Escape to Witch Mountain or Herbie Goes Bananas or The Boat Nicks or something like that, it is very likely that if they have a print, it's going to be an original release print that made the rounds back then that has probably faded. So it, it is this tricky game we play of seeing what might be available and requesting a title. And then sometimes, unfortunately, you know, they they pull these prints in a timely manner to them. They're going to pull it a week or so before they're going to send it to us and they send them to us in advance. Sometimes it's not until then that they find out that the prints they have are, are junk, basically. And the tricky spot that puts us in is that we have we try to announce our films as far in advance as we can because we know we're drawing people from literally all over the country to come to our movies. And people need time to plan and take time off and save up and do all that other stuff. So it's this unfortunate sort of conflagration because I like to use big words once in a while of events <laughs> where we've booked a film well in advance, but we don't find out until kind of zero hour that we can't play it. So that's what happened with Herbie goes bananas. And we just decided it's too late to try to put something else in there where it's, we're not going to draw the kind of crowd we would want, even if it was a slam dunk title, which is, we sort of talked about. So it's better to just, let's just take the day off. <laughs> let's take a Sunday yeah. off. Well, and it's one of those things like we don't want to keep replacing a date and have it be a situation where we don't have enough time to promote it. And I should be very, very clear. Or we should be very clear. It's not like it is a gamble when you come to the Mahoning Drive in theater, because most of the studios, they won't send us something that is not quality. 
they're not going to ship out something that is, you know, uh, pink beyond pink, uh, damage beyond repair. It's not going to happen. Um, but what we're finding with, um, you know, like the re recent acquisition of Fox and now them being handled through a different company, same thing with Disney. Um, you know, it's just one of those situations working with original prints. This is kind of the risk that we run on the programming side um, that really at any time we could get the word that, hey, that one print uh, got damaged or it got lost in shipping or it's no longer available or and really our only option is to shift, replace it or go digital, which we rarely, rarely try to do. So that was kind of our decision is. You know, we're not going to put out a subpar show. Um, we have a ton of Disney shows this year. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll work through and find those gems. And if something doesn't work, we'll move on to the next request. And just for the Herbie fans out there, first of all, <laughs> if I may talk directly to them, Mimi, other than that, <laughs> um, I did want to say that we are looking into the possibility of getting the original love bug on that big screen and any other Herbie movies that we find out are playable, but we're sort of, <laughs> we're helping Disney discover exactly what they have in their vault in which the, what they're <laughs> is. we're requesting stuff that I guarantee nobody has asked about in probably 20 years. So yeah. it, it's the vault runs deep, but uh, we're, we're taking this journey together with you to figure out, you know, if, if we can actually show anything. Burt Reynolds calls himself Bandit One. I put the pedal to the metal. I'm 1010 on the side. Jerry Reed calls himself Bandit Two. We gonna really have to cook. And Jackie Gleason, as Sheriff Buford T. Justice, calls them a whole lot worse. I got a barbecue yard. <laughs> Burt Reynolds, Sally Field, Jerry Reed, and Jackie Gleason in Smokey and the Bandit, rated PG, and that's a Big Ten Four, good buddy. Dog. Hot dog? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The hot dogs at our concession stand do rate an appreciative whistle. Hi, this is Adrienne Barbeau, and you're listening to Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Enjoy. This did lead into uh, something I had on the list of topics for the last couple of weeks that I wanted to talk to Jeff about, and that was the um, the different type of film stocks. A lot of times I'll be in the booth and Jeff will be inspecting a film and he'll tell me, oh, this is Fuji or this is safety film or this is acetate or if that's the right word, or this is Eastman. And I just kind of wanted to discuss that a little for the folks who are interested as to what the differences are. And, you know, what is what is encouraging to see as a film stock in your hands and, and what is something that makes you sweat a little bit? Well, it's interesting because, of course, um, years ago, up until around 1950, all film was made on nitrate stock. And nitrate is explosive, uh, very flammable. And so... Being a projectionist was a dangerous job uh, back in those days. Uh, you actually had the projection booth was made out of asbestos, and we all know how dangerous that can be. But back wow. then, nobody was thinking of, nobody was thinking about that. But uh, I ran a couple old theaters where the projection booth was made out of asbestos because you didn't want if a nitrate film caught on fire, it would take the whole booth, and you didn't want that getting out into the rest of the theater, obviously, and set the whole building on fire. Since safety film came out around 1950, everything's been done on safety film. You have two different types. The older safety film is acetate. And then the newer safety film, say, the last, uh, oh, 20 years, maybe 30 now, would be uh, mylar. And the difference between acetate and mylar, acetate is a little bit thicker film. Uh, mylar is a little bit thinner because it's tougher. Acetate film, you can rip, like you would take a piece of scotch tape and hold it in your fingers and rip it in half. You can right. do that with acetate. Mylar, you can't rip it. You can't, you, you know, you can stand there. The only way you can damage mylar is by actually cutting it with a scissors or yeah. with a splicer. So acetate, when you're talking about the older films that we're running, it doesn't take wear that well. It scratches easy and it dries out and gets very brittle. 
So Disney and some of the other studios are finding out when they take these out. And you're right. They inspect them first before they send them to us because they don't want anything getting out there that would put a bad reflection on them. They don't want us running something in our projectors that is going to rip every 20 minutes or every half hour or whatever. You know, you got three or four stops during a show because the film rips because it's brittle or because there's a lot of sprocket damage. They don't want that. So they're going to get out and they're going to look at them first. And then if it passes their inspection, they'll send them to us. And then we have to inspect them too, make sure all the splices are good, et cetera, et cetera. So that's with acetate film. Mylar, if the studio knows that it was printed on Mylar, they're not so worried because Mylar is hard to rip. It's hard to tear. And it's basically much more durable. You can run a Mylar film for hundreds and hundreds of times and it'll look brand new. So that's basically your differences in your film between nitrate, uh, acetate, and mylar. And what are the differences in film stock in terms of, of color um, retention and degradation? I know Eastman well, tends to be the one people mention that that is prone to fading. Right, because that is the only one I know of that really uh, deteriorates quickly. I mean, old Technicolor prints, they look beautiful to this day. I mean, if you had an original Technicolor of, say, Gone with the Wind or The Wizard of Oz, it should look like it did back when it was uh, first printed in 39. But Eastman Color was notorious. I mean, within 10 years, it was shot. I mean, within 10 years, you know, you make a print, run it around the circuit, then you put it in the vault, you know, eight, nine, eight, nine years later, you go back and look at it, and it's all pink. Uh, Eastman, I don't know what the chemical process is, but it just breaks down much faster turns pink and then what you're watching you know isn't even black and white it's pink and white and again like that's that's what we're working with i think that that type of wear that type of lived in feel is what we lean into you know the the imperfections in a print aren't something that we look at as ooh that's a you know it's that's part of the beauty. You know, we have an original print that's run through our original projectors. And, you know, if there's a, a splice or a, a little piece of a, a scene missing or something like that, that's part of the experience. You know, that's that's the stuff that you'll be talking about around the water cooler on Monday. To a certain to a certain extent. Yes. I mean, yeah, if if we want to run a film so badly that we're willing to run a pink print and we've done it many, many times. It's because it's sticking to the 35 millimeter uh, base that we operate from, that we always try to run 35 millimeter. The only reason we go to digital is because we absolutely have to. And we've run some pink prints. There's no doubt about it. Um, some aren't as noticeable as others, but we ran a print of Superman once that was very pink. And that almost was detrimental because you want to see the colors in oh, Superman, yeah. you don't, it, it, it really has to look good. And that was a little disappointing, but most of the pink prints we have aren't that bad. Most of them are only slightly pink. They still have a little color in them. And as far as splices go, Virgil's right. It adds to the uh, effect that it is really 35 millimeter film and not flawless digital. And people kind of enjoy that. They like to say, wow, this is real film. Look, a splice just went through. <laughs> you know, the, audio, the audio jumps to the next sentence or something, and it's part of the experience. But we won't, won't run anything that is totally bad because you can't. It's bad for the equipment. It's bad sure. for the experience. But uh, pink, you know, we don't mind so much as long as it's not really red. Yeah, if you're talking about, like you said, if it's, a movie that you're really, really looking for that color to pop, you know, and not right. having that grindhouse experience, if you will, you know, right. and I, sh I should say, I think that show was, we played Batman, uh, Tim Burton's Batman, and Dick Donner's Superman was a pink print. Batman looked good, but that Superman print was, uh, was less than awesome. And, <laughs> you know, we, we actually played, we did our Superman event last year and the studio print that we got was, was beautiful. We had no issues. It was, right. It was beautiful. Yeah. So, but again, it's, I love being in the booth in general. I love and being around uh, Jeff and Robert while they're working in there because it is, it's that type of 
knowledge and uh, information that I think any fan listening to this loves. You know, the idea of us letting people know when we have a rare IB Technicolor print or we have something that is, you know, being run just like it ran in 1940s is that's important to our audience. Maybe not to a traditional audience, but for the Mahoning audience, that's the type of stuff that is amazing. You know, I, I still stand by it. I've been to a ton of retro repertory screenings and it's it's almost on a nightly basis that there is a roar of applause after a movie stops at the Mahoning. That doesn't happen everywhere. Yeah. You know, uh, we had that last night for RoboCop. RoboCop was a beautiful print that came from Park Circus, pretty much flawless. And I said it to Jeff over the mic. The, the presentation was absolutely gorgeous. The night was gorgeous. People were just so into it. Turnout was amazing. It's this is this is like a, an ongoing regular occurrence for us. And and Mark, I think you said it during the podcast. It doesn't matter if there's 200 people, 600, 800. They are having the time of their lives and making memories that they won't soon forget. And, you know, everybody's work and effort toward putting on a show at the Mahoning is is a, a huge piece to that. Right. And uh you definitely know it when the stars that we have come in and sign autographs and, you know, memorabilia. And when they start saying, wow, this is great. You know, uh, Zach Galgan was like, oh, I'd love to come back. I can't wait. Uh, of course, star of the Gremlins movies. When you have the stars coming in and, and expressing themselves that they love the place. I mean, you know, you're doing something right. Absolutely. You know, and, and we have a ton of these level up moments every single year. But certainly that was the case with uh, David Lynch over this last weekend. And um, we said it on this podcast so far. That is our business model is to slowly raise the bar, not bite off more than we can chew, especially coming out of the pandemic. So that was our thought. We had a nice safe sellout last year. Let's try to raise that slightly for this event. Zombie Fest will raise it slightly. Um, and by the time we get to Joe Bob, it'll be smooth sailing, you know. For those of you guys that don't know, there is a guy named Joe Bob coming. Oh, did Joe Bob's coming? Day. That's what I heard. That's what I hear. <laughs> now, we've been really deep in that planning. Things are coming together and solidifying. We get emails asking, hey, can I be a vendor? Hey, can I get extra tickets? Hey, can I? There's a lot going on in the planning. As we kind of find things out, we're going to trickle them out. I'm sure people have noticed there's been a little bit of radio silence with the JB. Um, event, but that's only because we are uh, trying to figure out the best way to serve and uh, rock this event like no other. But I can say it, easily going to be the greatest event the Mahoning Drive-In has ever put on. Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. Packed in a jar for the freshest flavor. Served cold in a sack for you to savor. So dainty to eat, no muss, no fuss. An ideal snack for all of us. Crisp, tender and tasty with a bit of spice. Buy one now. Taste how nice. Snack bar clerks will knock themselves silly. Speeding your order for a real chilly dilly. So I reached out to Joe Bob's folks and let them know that we do want to put out an apology to the fans because of the experience that they had with the Ticket Leap website. But uh, here is a great place to say it. Hopefully people will hear this and uh, let the people that might be upset know. It's a very simple, simple situation. Ticket Leap we have been using all season, have not had a single issue with, but this is the first event that we have ever announced ahead of time and have ever given a definitive drop time and drop date on when the tickets would go on sale. And had uh, probably tens of thousands of people who wanted to click the same button at the same time. Yes, this was a very, very in-demand event, certainly more in-demand than any event the Mahoning has ever done. Um, and I think a lot to do with that is the fact that Saturday is a filming of a lot of people's favorite show on the planet, The Last Drive-In. So when your favorite show announces that they're doing maybe the only live taping of your favorite show, you're going to make a point to try to get those tickets. So literally every everybody and their mother tried to jump on at noon to get those saturday specifically tickets and what we have in place with ticket leap 
is an anti-crash system that puts people into a very simple virtual waiting line where they just kind of move up gradually. They get their tickets um, as they get closer to the front of this line. Well, uh, they crashed the anti-crash system. There was so much demand for Saturday and so many people in that virtual line that it just crashed out on people. So the plus I can say is of the 800 tickets that were available, they went almost instantly. So the people that experienced the crash, they weren't getting Saturday tickets anyway. I hate to break that news. Um, there were going to be thousands of people who were disappointed regardless of the crash. But it's funny because this is the lore of Joe Bob and the mutants that uh, Joe Bob's fandom has become. They crashed Shudder when Joe Bob first hit Shudder. They crashed out that site. So let's add this and chalk it up to the insane fandom that Joe Bob has behind him and the show has behind them that crashed another site. But um, the beautiful thing is a lot of people had no issues. We had a ton of people with no problems. But of course, there were a lot of people who were very upset. Uh, that they thought they were going to be getting their Saturday tickets, were waiting in a line that crashed, and then when they went back in, they were sold out. But I can say it, if you missed out on Saturday, you were probably going to miss out on it anyway. <laughs> it was instant that there were 800 people in that line, almost instant. Uh, so that's kind of the long and short what happened with the ticketing situation with Joe Bob. But Friday and Saturday sold out within, well, Saturday sold out within minutes. Friday sold out within probably a half hour to 45 minutes. And Sunday, there's actually still a couple tickets left. So again, shows you where that insane demand was. People looking to come in for Friday, stay for Saturday, um, and hopefully stick it out for Sunday. So we're beyond excited, even with the hiccup. We live and we learn. Now we know that when it comes to um, a larger than normal event, maybe taking on um, a different approach as far as selling tickets. Um, but that's that's kind of our motto here is we live and we learn. We learn from our mistakes. I even saw when somebody was uh, was heated in the thread about, ah, I've been, I got kicked off. I was there at a certain time. Somebody popped in and said, if you listen to their podcast, this is a small group of people running this uh, very large business at this point. And they certainly learn from their mistakes. So that's kind of uh, where we're at and we're, we're staying insanely positive, even though that was a very, very, very stressful day for us. <laughs> so now we know when we do the Liberace tribute show next season, um, we're going to partner. <laughs> yeah. we're gonna get, oh, should I not yes, have talked yeah. about that already? I, yeah. That's supposed be to be careful. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you already blew the, uh, the Denny Terrio. <laughs> Denny Terrio sure, dances sure. along to Saturday Night Fever live. Yes. And man shadow cast. I'm telling you, we should smash that and the Liberace together and we got a hit. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then we'll take it uh, on the road and the sky's the limit. Yes. Yeah. But that, that's the beautiful thing I keep trying to, to take away and push to people about the Joe Bob event. Boy, oh boy, does this bode well for this being an annual event. It by far exceeded the expectation that JB and his team had. Clearly exceeded our expectations on the ticketing end. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. This is something that now fans can look forward to every year. They can guarantee that it will get better. The experience will get better. The ticketing will get better. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a really, really magical weekend. That's what I tell people online and in person if they're kind of bummed about missing a show that sells out. As I say, nothing guarantees a a part two so much as a part one selling out. And that's true yeah. in any kind of commercial endeavor. So, you know, as well as this David Lynch weekend does, we're already talking about bringing it back. Mad Max did so well, we know we're bringing that back. It's It would be foolish not to, and it allows people who missed out the first time to to get that experience. Absolutely. Right. That's exactly the thing. If, if we don't bring these shows back, then it's only a certain number or number of people that are ever going to have seen it. So the more successful they are, the quicker we bring them back, the more people that didn't get to see them the first time, they'll get to see them the second time or the third time, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. The Mahoning was built on annual events. Let's be real. You know, is there's a reason we're, we're going into Zombie Fest number seven. 
is when events work, we we bring them back. We make that's what makes them events. You know, we do a ton of one off standalone things that we try out. But even people are saying, hey, Thanksgiving, what an awesome idea. And I'm like, well, if you want it to come back, come on out to Thanksgiving, you know. If you want to see Slash, if you want to see whatever your favorite Hanks movie, come out and support it. And you never know. Thanksgiving Volume 2 or the second serving may be coming next year. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Thanksgiving 3, just desserts. I, yes, um, come on. I've been telling everybody that about the spaghetti Sundays. I love spaghetti westerns. And some people are saying, oh, you should do Death Rides a Horse or The Great Silence or all of these not as well known spaghetti westerns. And I said, the way we get to those movies is to get through the Leone trilogy and have those do really well. Yep. And have this be, you know, show us that there's support. Because if we get weekends where we've got 10 people or five cars, that financially does not make sense to keep going with movies that even fewer people know. So I'm, sure. I'm with anything. If you if you want more of something, if you have the financial and physical ability to do so, please come out and support it. Exactly. And people ask, they say, "Hey, when when are the, when's the gangster weekend coming back? When is Kung Fu coming back? When are you guys doing Bigfoot again?" And it's like, well, those weekends didn't work out as well as we had hoped, so they were standalone singles, but. Don't get me wrong. We're going to swing for the fence every single year. There's a lot of personal kind of uh, bookings on the calendar, as well as the ones that are right on the notes, you know? So we really don't know what is going to be a hit and what is not. There's some that we're like, well, this should kill. This should crush. And then it doesn't, you know? So I was so sure that Clueless and Mean Girls, those movies were too new Everybody else had already played them, including Becky's just up the street. And yep. that sh that was nearly a sold out show. So yeah, you know, was sold out. I know. Yeah, it's one of those things you, you really can't tell until you kind of, you know, set it up on a tee and swing. So that's the nice thing is that our audience now that it has built allows us to uh, swing for the fences a little bit harder. And that's something that I'm, I know I sat and talked with Jeff with about this year. And when fans come in and they talk about, hey, is there any way you're ever going to play this super obscure movie that only I love? It's like, yeah, we love we love it, too. There might oh, yeah. be an option, you know. That's usually so, my answer. I want that to play, too. <laughs> if we can only get 100 more people to agree with us, it'll happen. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. We'll never know unless we put it on. You know, we wrestling weekend last year was maybe the biggest gamble that we ever took. We thought, wow, this is really a, a strange concept to bring to a drive in. Will it work? We tie in wrestling movies, keep it themed. And it was an absolute home run. And it proved to us that, like, this needs to be part of the Mahoning lineup and part of the Mahoning summer experience, you know. So it's really great. A show like that carries on the drive-in tradition of doing something extra beyond the movie during the day, something for people to do to get them on the lot and, and enjoy themselves before the sun goes down. Because otherwise, there's not a lot you can do on the lot during the day. Some drive-ins would, would have swap meets. Some would have, you know, pony rides or little trains that went around the outside of the place to, you know, entertain and make a little extra money. And uh, I'm all for finding things that we can do during the day that people can enjoy. I mean, Camp Blood, to a degree, we do that. We have the exhumed comes out and does the camping type summer camp type games and contests and stuff on the lot during the day before the sun goes down and i think uh, having live wrestling under the screen is just fabulous and again last year people couldn't really go out and see sporting events at all so it was the only way to see wrestling kind of anywhere as far as i know was was doing it last year and and uh it was so much fun the, the snack bar action really slowed down during the matches because that's what a lot of the people were there for. So most of the snack bar staff, we walked outside and we watched them too. And, and we all had so much fun. And if anybody doesn't know, Lehigh Valley uh, Athletic, what does the LVAC stand for in the wrestling term? So Lee, I think it's Lehigh Valley Athletic Co. Because they, they're they traditionally Lehigh, Var Lehigh Valley Apparel Co. Right. They have put out a DVD of the show they did at our drive-in last year. So if you find it on their website, it is all the matches and it's the extra stuff they shot where two guys were just wailing on each other in and out of the projection booth and snack. Yeah. Bar. And ultimately one guy jumped off the roof onto another guy outside the projection booth. We were like, slack, I mean, more than usual, slack jawed watching that. 
And uh, I still have to buy a copy of that because I want a nice memento of that weekend that was, you know, professionally shot. And uh, it was, I was never a wrestling fan. I was aware of it in the eighties, but I thought it was silly. I've since come to appreciate it in more recent years for the, for the athleticism and the humor and the storylines and all that. And right. it was really funny. I mean, the, the announcers they had and the wrestlers were great. They do such a good job. Chris and the LVAC guys are like knocking it out the park. I, I say it, they're creating their own group of of fandom very much like the mahoning is a very loyal group of uh of followers and they're more than a part of this family i went to chris last week and i was like we were running out of david lynch t-shirts by friday and he was like look i'm here for the long haul i'll print some more out for you guys i'll bring them up when i'm here tomorrow for saturday so it's like he bends over backwards for us and this partnership is a great way for us to support um, their other venture, LVAC's other venture. And it's a match made in heaven. You brought it up with uh, them wrestling in throughout the stand. So Chris came to me um, on Saturday of last year and said, if we promise to be super careful, can we shoot a little promo going through the concession stand and through the projection booth? And I said, as long as you promise not to damage anything. So we walked through and they were like, Hey, this film reel, can we use this as a little, uh, you know, weapon? Can we use, can we use this uh, trailer here and unspool it and I can strangle a guy with it? And I was like, okay, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Which so, one of these ancient records can we pull out and smash over the other guy? Literally, head? literally. It wound up being seals and crofts. That's right. So yeah, it, it's just, it's a great situation. And again, that's the thing we kept getting this weekend in the social media tags is, the Mahoning goes above and beyond for their shows like no other theater. And that'll certainly be the case this weekend because, you know, that's certainly above and beyond. Showing wrestling movies and They Live and all that stuff would be an awesome event. But you toss live wrestling into it and it's like, what world have I just gone into? <laughs> I was a wrestling fan and I, I really, really love the style that they put out because it does remind me very much of those that classic 80s early 90s era where the characters were everything you know but the, i have all sorts of merch from their wrestlers now me and uh our, our tech um our projection tech scott we were talking about he's like is the great cheeseburger gonna be there again mm. i'm like cheeseburger's gonna be in the house <laughs> so our cheeseburgers just, are great <laughs> They actually yeah, have are. a wrestler named Cheeseburger, and he's amazing. It's it's great. It's really fun. So we're looking forward to it. One thing that I thought was interesting is we're trying to come up with films, wrestling themed movies to show uh, each night, you know, four per weekend. And there aren't that many. Well, there aren't that many that have marquee value, shall we say. I mean, yeah. you can go with the, 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 the filmography of Hulk Hogan, and you can go with the filmography of Roddy Piper. But beyond that, if you're talking about movies about wrestling, we did uh, a secret film last year, which is what most people thought of first. Uh, yeah. We we did uh, Ready to Rumble. But mm -hmm. beyond that, I was looking and I'm like, oh, there's all the marbles, which is about, you know, female wrestlers with Peter Falk that nobody remembers. Or there's <laughs> the one and only from the 70s with Henry Winkler, which is a really good movie, but like, nobody knows it. So The one and only was actually requested this was year. And, and I ended up taking it off. But yeah, like that's the thing is, you know, we're we're digging a little bit. I would love to get into the Santo titles, get into oh, some of the Luchador stuff. That might be the that's move. very, very hard for 35. But I said it like the LVAC is putting on this event and there's a little more forgiveness when somebody else is coming in and putting on an event as far as if something needs to be digital. So, for example, Beyond the Mat does not have a 35 millimeter release. We will have to be playing that on digital. Um, but, you know, again, I went to LVAC. I said, look, if this were something I was booking for the theater, I might say, look, let's let's go for the one and only because we can get it on 35. But for the sake of the program and the the event that they're putting on, they said, let's go for it. You know, I don't think anybody's going to. Uh, miss a beat because this is on digital you know it's the only way to see it so but it, it's it's one of those events that solidified it's going nowhere um i pitched 
and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. I pitched Nacho Libre this year because I love Nacho Libre. It's it, it does a love and hated movie. I know it. Even when I watch it, I can tell why people hate it. But for me and my family, it is maybe the most quotable movie. We laugh at this thing like no other. Jack Black is the greatest in our ho- in our household. So, but LVAC and Chris specifically, he, he said to me, I've only walked out of two movies in my life. <laughs> I said, I know where this is going. Early Sue <laughs> and Nacho Libre. <laughs> So, yeah, we ended up taking that off. But believe me, I'm going to try to sell that next year because I think, especially for families coming out, it's a really easy pill to swallow. Um, You know, and I think it does, regardless of how some people passionately don't like it. I think there is a fan base for it uh, that would get a real kick out of watching that late at night uh, with all their friends. Well, even if they do hate it, they'll get to see the trailer this weekend because it was one of two wrestling themed trailers. In our mutual collections. So sorry, do what we can. Sorry, or you're welcome, whichever way it goes. Uh, I'm very appreciative. Virgie's going to laugh his ass off. As you leave the theater, folks, please be careful. Don't let this happen to your car. Be sure to remove the speaker before you leave. If you should accidentally pull a speaker loose, please turn it in at our snack bar or box office. Thank you. Hey everybody, this is Zach Allegan from Gremlins and Waxwork and all sorts of other movies you probably saw at the drive-in. You're listening to Mahoning Drive-In Radio. So let's talk about drive-in memories. We all grew up as people who attended drive-ins regularly, long before we ever thought we'd be working at one. And uh, we have memories of shows spanning (laughs) more decades than any of us would like to admit. So do any of you guys have a specific like incident you remember or a movie you remember seeing? Um, it doesn't even have to be anything profound, just something from the from the misty shadows. <laughs> well, let me tell you. We had a drive-in when I was little called the Super Skyway Drive-In. Uh, it was in uh, Coonsville, Pennsylvania, which is not too far outside of Allentown. And for my eighth birthday, I believe it was. Uh, My parents had a surprise party for me at the drive-in. They called the management and asked if they could come on the lot early during the day and have this birthday party for me. And of course, the manager said, sure, yeah, no problem. There won't be anybody there, but, you know, come on the lot, you know, have your birthday party, whatever. And I didn't know all about any of this at all. And uh, they said one day on my birthday, well, let's get in the car, you know, so I'm thinking, "Ah, I wonder what's going on. So they they go over to the Super Skyway drive-in, and they're driving into the lot. They don't stop at the ticket booth. They just keep on. I'm wondering, what's going on? It's not even dark yet. This is, you know, what? And then I found out, you know, they drag all this stuff out of the back of the trunk and stuff. And, you know, and they had a birthday party for me. And so I always remember that uh, that's where I saw Mary Poppins for the first time. Mary Poppins was a brand new wow. movie. It was, Disney, it was Disney's latest release. And that was my birthday movie that night was Mary Poppins. Unfortunately, I don't remember what the second show was anymore, but I always remember the birthday party, the cake, the family. And then uh, by the time all that was done, you know, this drive-in started to open up, the staff started coming in and getting the place open. And then we were there for Mary Poppins and uh, a second feature. And that always sticks out in my mind because, um, we went to drive-ins all over the Allentown area, went to every single one, ones that are long gone, like the Super Skyway, which Virgil actually saw where that was. I took him yeah. to where that, it's an empty, it's an empty field now. And uh, at one time they were going to de- develop the land, but it was stupid. They tore the drive-in down and then something must have fallen through. Nothing ever happened. So it's an empty field. You could walk it, you know, you think you're walking into... Uh, it, that's what it looks like, an empty field. Um, and uh, it's such a shame. But that was the Super Skyway drive-in, and that was my memory that really sticks with me uh, out of all the drive-ins that we went to. And when you were a kid in that era, how many drive-ins would you say offhand you your family would frequent? Oh, my gosh. Uh, let's see. 
Was, it, was there really a lot of them near you that were within a shortish drive? Right, because we lived like half an hour from Allentown. Uh, myself, to this day, I still live about half an hour from Allentown. And uh, we went to all of them back then. Mostly, I would say, the Super Skyway and the West End Drive-In. But we also went to uh, the Bethlehem Drive-In, the Starlight Drive-In, the Quakertown Drive-In, which was more like 45 minutes away. Uh, we went to the Shimerville Drive-In, um, Boulevard Drive-In. Uh, mm, I think that's about all that's hit me. Oh, well, well, we even went to Shankweiler's a few times. So we hit all the drive-ins in the Allentown area. And of course, as most people know, the only one that's left anymore is Shankweiler's. That's it. Yep. You know, the rest of them are long gone. And it's such a shame because... Uh, uh, for example, the West End Drive-In was a two-story building. The concession stand had two stories for it, to it. The first floor was all concession. The second floor was the booth. The booth was actually on the second floor of the building. I've seen a drive-in in, in uh, Rhode Island like that, and it has three screens, and so they so they you, they project you know like in three directions simultaneously. Right, and there's a good chance that the original booth was on the first floor, and now it's used for something else. I've seen drive-ins like that too. But this one was built as a two-story drive-in from the beginning. Uh, and it only had one screen back then, of course, was a single screen. Like all drive-ins, the old drive-ins on the East Coast were all built with a single screen. Nobody was thinking about, you know, multiplexing, as they call it, and stuff like that. All old original drive-ins, single screen when they started out. And uh, But this one had a second floor. And I just thought that was neat. That's awesome. Yeah, for sure, my... My a lot of my childhood memories come from the Bucks County twin, but definitely a series of memories come to mind. So I begged my parents, uh, my mother specifically, to take me to see Jurassic Park at the drive in when it came out in gosh, July, I guess, of 93. And it was so we went on opening night to the Bucks County twin, the line literally was down the road it would come off onto 611 and just rock all the way down the road and people would line up they'd get everybody in so i told my mom i said look we have to get in this line she was literally like we're not going to do this we're turning around there's no way we're going to get in so we wait in this line opening weekend and i want to say from my memory jurassic park was the first movie and I think it was in the line of fire or something um, for the second beach. So uh, we go, line slowly creeping up, slowly creeping up, slowly creeping up. And the sold out sign gets put in the window as we're about 10 or 15 cars away from the ticket booth. And one of those situations where they had reached capacity, that's how they kind of worked their situation. All the cars that were in line slowly had to back up, turn around, and move on. So I went home insanely disappointed that weekend, but begged my mom the following weekend to take me back. For that weekend, it was Jurassic Park and I think Sleepless in Seattle. So my mom was like, let's do this. So we went, we were a little bit further up in line. Um, we got in, we had a great, great experience. Um, God, I can't remember if it was just me and my mom or my uh, siblings were with us, but um, loved Jurassic Park, fell asleep for Sleepless, but my mom loves Sleepless. And uh, I begged her, hey, can we go back next week too? Because Jurassic Park was so good. So three weeks in a row, we go back. Uh, this time the line wasn't as bad. Uh, we got in without any problems, but we took the whole family because it was Jurassic Park and Rookie of the Year, which I don't know if you guys remember that movie. It was about a kid who breaks his arm and it heals him properly and he can throw a fastball like crazy and he gets recruited by the Cubs at like 11 years old. So it was like the greatest movie for me to watch with my brother and my sister. At the time, I think I was literally 11. I was 11 years old. So uh, love Jurassic Park, obviously. But I can quote Rookie of the Year word for word because of that experience that we had at the drive-in. Uh, cheering on that movie, cheering on Henry Rowan Gardner. And I remember uh, specifically that son-in-law was playing on the other um, screen. And my mom 
did not like Polly Shore at all. <laughs> she did not get that humor. But I remember, not a fan of the weasel. But I remember during that first screening after Jurassic Park was over, um, the way that the Bucks County Twin is situated, it's a it's a twin, two the, two screens, um, and the concession stand splits them along with a big long row of trees. So I remember I told my mom, hey, I'm going to use the bathroom, went over to the bathroom during intermission and just walked over to the other screen and sat and watched a little bit of Son-in-Law, uh, which, by the way, I freaking love Son-in-Law to this day. Not because of that moment. Um, I probably didn't get it when I was 11. But uh, yeah, that's that's one that always sticks out to me as far as making it a point to see a movie on opening night at the drive-in because I knew it was going to be kind of larger than life in that setting and it didn't disappoint that's for sure and it's interesting uh, talking about your early memories at the uh bucks county twin drive-in because uh, i used to work for that company that owned the bucks county twin Bunker, and i went up right? there one, yeah budco i went up yeah. there one day and took a look at it uh because you know bucks county twin and i thought i'll bet that was a single screen at one time so I mm -hmm. went up there and I looked at it and it was when it, it was oh, yeah. just the Bucks County drive-in when it first opened. It was only a single screen drive-in uh, in its first many years. So uh, I was right about that. It was interesting because what they did is they closed up the original booth and they put two booths, like two little block buildings uh, on either side of the concession stand. And then they had the two screens. They actually tore down the original single screen. They tore it down and put two screens up front instead of one. And you could still see the uh, cement base where the old single screen used to stand. And so it was uh, an interesting uh, makeover, to say the least. Yeah, I, and I knew no, no different as a kid. I thought, this is what drive-ins are. You know, I said, this is, right. just must be how it's laid out. But I used to love, because it, even though they had the tree line going across, you could l literally look to the right or the left and see the other screen. You know, so you could just yeah. kind of if you if you got bored with the movie, just let your eye wander or literally just walk over there. That's the thing I love, too, is there was no sort of restriction on, hey, you can't walk over here. You're supposed to be. So I used to breeze over all the time and just kind of sit on their gravel and watch it. From what I remember, their concession stand was open in the front. They had like these kind of bay sliding things that come down and up. And you could, yeah. while you were in line, you could almost look out and see the screen as well, which I thought on a, on a beautiful night was just the coolest. It was like an open air concession stand. Exactly. Yeah. What about you, Mark? What's your, uh, what's your gem story? I don't know how much of a story it is. So one of my uh, great cinematic and fictional character loves uh, in a manly way is James Bond. It really kicked in for me probably in junior high when I was discovering the ABC Sunday night movie broadcasts of the Bond films. And it was probably Goldfinger that they aired at some point when I was in junior high and I, I watched it and it really set the world on fire for me. I had been seeing those films before that. And one of the first cinematic memories I have is going with my father and my uncle to the Escutney drive-in in Escutney, Vermont, which was 10 minutes maybe from Claremont, New Hampshire, where I grew up. Um, very, very short drive away. My parents were never the kind to drive very far to see a movie. We had a triple cinema strip mall theater in our town. We had the drive-in in our town and we had a single screen old movie palace in our town. So I think in their heads, it was like, why would he travel to see anything? It's movies, pick one. But in this occasion, my father and my uncle wanted to see the new James Bond film in 1979, which was Moonraker. So we drove to see Moonraker at the Escutney Drive-In and the co-feature was The Great Train Robbery, the Michael yes. Crichton directed or written Great Train Robbery, which starred Sean Connery, which yeah. didn't mean anything to me as a four-year-old or a five-year-old. But looking back, it was sort of like you got two bonds for the price of one that night. <laughs> Straight, that's a stroke of great programming right it, it there. It kind of is. And, and that's, it's a fun movie. It, uh, Connery and, and Donald Sutherland and like sort of oh, yeah. podcast. Um, nothing to do with the silent film of the same name. So I, I don't have a lot of memories of it, but I remember seeing Moonraker on the big screen. I remember having to look up at a steep angle at the screen and just how gigantic that image was. Seeing those space station shots toward the end. I mean, Moonraker's a dumb movie. I love the Bond films, but 
Moonraker is one of those that when I rented it, when DVDs were first coming out, I rented a DVD player from the video store before I had a DVD and I rented Moonraker on DVD with my friend Rick and we watched it. And I was like, you know, I may never need to see this again. I, I think most Bond films have a moment or two that are, are great, no matter how good or bad the movie is. And Moonraker has a few, but overall it's, it's pretty silly. For me, the Bond films always make the mistake. They make a mistake every so many decades of trying to follow the trends and not set them. And Moonraker was clearly, what kind of thing can we do to ape Star Wars? Let's put him in space <laughs> with, with the silver suit and lasers. And yeah. it's yeah. just ridiculous. The opening pre-titles <laughs> is great. And there's the, the gondola chase is great. And there's some other moments, but a lot of it's just not that great. So anyway, I saw Moonraker, my first Bond film. Little did I know how obsessed I would become with that film series when I got a little older. But I saw Moonraker on the big screen at the drive-in, and it was just amazing. It was one of those things where, you know, you're smaller, so everything seems larger to your point of view there. But that screen was the size of a skyscraper to me. And looking up at that angle and seeing the interior of this gigantic space station, to me, actual size or bigger, it left a pretty big impression on me. Um, I don't think... I don't recall that we ever went back to that drive-in and I have no memory of anything other than sitting in the car and seeing the screen. My family wasn't the type to hit the snack bar. Uh, we, we really wanted to just screw the theater as hard as we could. We brought our own food. We did that too, every time, <laughs> every single did. time, every time. Or, or did, you know, most people yeah. weren't aware of the finances of a, of a theater and the fact that the only money a theater really makes is at the snack bar. Now, even no matter where I go, I will always buy a soda. Even if it's a big chain, I'll always buy something to keep the place running um, but but at the time we had this little igloo cooler with the white top with the red bottom the oh yeah 70s igloo cooler which i still have and when i started oh, frequenting wow. drive-ins again in the 90s i found that there was one near to where i was living in new hampshire at the time i wound up bringing that and it was this wonderful beautiful the past that i was bringing i was smuggling in food again once more i was once again <laughs> putting the screws to some poor theater owner but um i, I now i just always buy food at the theater. we are what we learn you know what i, I mean I know. it's People like no yeah. until you tell them look my you know my dad always snuck in a couple goobers in each pocket when we went to the indoor you know that's what he was that wasn't what he called you, you and your brother was it <laughs> Goobers he wore, to this a, he day. wore a huge coat and he would always sneak his his little goober <laughs> to the theater. He he would if he could, I'm sure. <laughs> so so anyway, the the Escutney Drive-in, uh, it was open since I think the '60s. I'm doing a little research into that alongside researching everything that we ever played in our history. Uh, and putting those on Patreon, sharing those old uh, scans from old newspapers. It lasted, I think, into the 80s, the drive-in I went to at, for, to see Moonraker. And it became at some point a dirty drive-in, I'm told, showing, you know, Ooh. R-rated or yeah. worse films. Now, the screen didn't face anything. It, it's not like our screen where you can kind of see it from the road. You can see it with binoculars from Walmart. This screen faced like the woods. So you, you couldn't, they, they could get away with that. But um, eventually it closed and it was abandoned for a long time. Then some aspect of it, I think, burned down or, or something like that. And then uh, a church now sits on those grounds. So I always thought it was funny that it went <laughs> from normal drive-in to dirty drive-in to like the ground has been cleansed. The church. <laughs> and now something is, as pure as can be is sitting there. Amazing. Yeah. Usually, uh, that was a drive-in's last gasp was to go rated X. That was usually oh, yeah. the last gasp of a drive-in. And um, it started the earliest drive-in that I can remember being torn down because I was still little was the airport drive-in hmm. on Airport Road right outside of Allentown. That was torn down in 62. Wow. 62. That's before drive-ins hit their rough spot. I mean, this is in 62. And... Uh, we would drive by it before it was torn down. And of course it was abandoned. There were a couple holes in the screen and I could never understand that because we went to all the other drive-ins in the Allentown area. And here's this one that was, you know, we obviously was going to be torn down and it just didn't make any sense to me. Of course I was a kid at the time, but I still thought, you know, what a shame. I would have liked to have seen a movie in that drive-in before it went dark. And, uh, you know, it, was, it just never happened. But, uh, yeah, and then, of course, most drive-ins met their fate. You know, 70s, 80s is when they were tearing them down right and left. And uh, that's why we don't have a lot of them today. And so many were built originally on the outskirts of town. They were rural areas where, you know, you didn't have light pollution. You didn't have a lot of neighbors or anything. 
And then with the case with the the Claremont drive-in in New Hampshire, where I grew up, the one, my my hometown drive-in, is you know what was a sort of a rural strip of of road on the outskirts of town got developed more and more, and development came right up next door to the drive-in, and then basically overtook it. It got torn down and turned into a Walmart. And uh, I, I see that in a lot of places, like a lot of the drive-ins that survived are still kind of not near anything. I don't think it's unless you're out in California or somewhere where you see them like right in the middle of industrial areas and things like that. They tend to still be kind of remote. Right. And a lot of the drive-ins out in California aren't original drive-ins. They were originally something else. What happened there is they tore down all the old drive-ins that were there in the 40s and 50s. Then all of a sudden they didn't have any. Then they looked around and said, okay, now where can we build a new one? <laughs> so, yeah, so it, it comes full circle. Whereas right. here, here on the East Coast, the ones that were torn down are still torn down. And uh, the few that are left are, that's the only game in town, basically. And you're right. Part of the Mahoning Drive-In's existence is because it's still in the middle of nowhere. And all the drive-ins in the Allentown area were torn down because you're right. The city overtook them. The land became more valuable as a Walmart or apartments or whatever, housing developments, and they just went away. Yeah. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, the the X-rated being the, the, the last breath for a lot of drive-ins. So when I partnered up with Jeff, I got really deep into the 300 drive-ins that are still open and original. And believe it or not, the Apache drive-in in in Texas is still showing X-rated movies every single week. And they are the only one in the country that is still surviving on X-rated films. From what I remember doing that research, I think they also have like an adult video and bookstore attached on the lot. That's what I heard. I think sort of the snack bar is that and they just have a video projector running who knows what on some screen. I think somebody posted <laughs> photos. The screen is like half falling apart. I think it's. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's questionable. But I say it like I told Nance, my dream for this year is, you know, since we're going so hard for six months that we might be able to go see some drive ins in the off season. And, you know, that's on the list. <laughs> right. Exactly. What a fun family trip. Cover your eyes, kids. We're hitting the Apache. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, uh, you know, it's one of those things. I, I love any drive-in that has, you know, been able to survive this long and is still, you know, rocking with us. But, you know, to see something like that, you're like, oh, wow. You know, anything can really happen. Tying these threads together, Jeff, you had mentioned, I think it was the Boulevard and the Starlight drive-ins. Yeah. Looking through um, the listings in the Allentown Morning Call newspaper from the 70s into the 80s, I'm up to now trying to find old Mahoning listings. The Starlight and the Boulevard had big ads and they were pretty seriously the sleazy drive-ins in the late 70s going into the 80s. They they had the triple features of school teacher movies. And I, I think it was R-rated stuff, a lot of Euro sleaze and retitled movies. But right. it, it's it's the kind of stuff that when certain people think drive-in movies, that's what they think about. Um, I think in reality, most drive-ins mostly le- leaned toward family fare. Oh, yeah. Like if you look through the Mahoning's history, it was mostly pretty mainstream palatable stuff and maybe one night a week i think in the 50s if you looked one night a week they would run like the aip stuff like the juvenile delinquent movies the hot rod gang and go go beat girl and all that kind of stuff but it looked to me like in that sweet spot of the late 70s the boulevard and the starlight were really leaning into the horror and exploitation and and sleaze and they were sort of the the go-tos for that yes they were trying to find a niche they were trying to find a direction to go in that nobody else was doing. And so, yeah, they would run some mainstream stuff, but then they would get a little edgy on some of the nights. They were trying to please everybody is what they were trying to do. And that's almost an impossible task. Uh, Like today, you're either going to be first run, second run doesn't almost, uh, almost doesn't exist anymore. At one time, uh, the big theaters got the movies first. Uh, If you had a smaller theater, you waited two or three weeks and then you could get it when the first run theaters were done with it. And that was called second run. Nowadays, especially with digital, it's to the point where you're either first run and you get it all at the same time, or you're doing something different because there really is no second run anymore. 
what I'm finding that interesting to to jump into the present, like the immediate present, is I'm seeing this season, 2021, a lot of drive-ins having a co-feature that's a couple of years old. So not really retro, but older than for a second run, like um, the, the Riverside Drive-In, Todd and the, the gang at the Riverside Drive-In. They are running Army of the Dead, this new zombie film, and the co-feature yep. is World War Z, which is a movie that's a decade old. I'm not really sure. It's yeah. a handful of years old. And I'm seeing people yeah. run like it's very interesting to me because it's not it's not stone cold classic retro like a lot of people would do and i'm seeing you know i follow a lot of different drive-ins on facebook and i'm seeing this everywhere is that they're billing a co-feature that makes sense but isn't brand new and isn't you know one of the 10 movies everybody runs so studios are offering now with their big release blockbusters to drive-ins a co-feature at a really good rate um, that kind of falls in with that movie. The big one that you saw, gosh, what was it, last week or two weeks ago, was Godzilla and Kong and Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's been out for, you know, however long. Since December. Yep, so that's a thing where purely Warner Brothers is, is putting it out there like, hey, we got this huge new blockbuster release and this theatrical release that didn't do so great when it came out because of the pandemic, this is a really uh, good opportunity to kind of boost those numbers and also give people kind of a, uh, a like-minded popcorn movie, you know? But that's what I'm seeing is, is that, you know, you're going to see a lot of that. We're still in this weird place now, too, where the studios don't have a lot of product out there. Like there, a lot of what I feel like is hitting the screens are movies that probably wouldn't have gotten a theatrical release, would have gone to Netflix or Prime or something like that. But because right. production was halted for so long, um, and they're still trying to save up the big tentpole movies and not just you know blow them all out at once, the studios are scrambling to to fill out those double bills and and to even fill indoor theater screens. There's a lot of really eclectic stuff out there that I think very few theaters would be showing if <laughs> if they didn't have any choice in the matter. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things, you know, uh, the double feature situation, the built-in model, all that stuff. It's really a, a strange thing to navigate, especially when there is limited product now in Hollywood. There's kind of timed releases. There's a lot to juggle. You know, I certainly don't envy the first run outfits, but Hey, it's this is the new world that we live in. You know, me and Scott and me and you talk about it all the time too where it's like I think we're just going to see things kind of uh shift and become kind of a new normal. Whether those that bar lowers as far as how much a movie makes in the box office versus what it makes afterwards and aftermarket and that's kind of making up for I don't know. It's it's a very strange thing, but something I've been seeing and taking notice to is that we're seeing things that should be on other platforms, streaming platforms being sold to Netflix or being sold to Amazon. And my thought behind that is, okay, we uh, we got close with the, the the box office numbers, but how can we gain a little bit more out of this? Let's let's do a sale and give them a limited uh, streaming release rights. Or that's again, that's just my thought, but. I'm thinking that that's, again, probably just a, an easy studio inside business move is to to kind of work this out and get it to as many people as possible. And, and what's funny for us, just like last season, the 2020 pandemic season, um, it doesn't really affect us, <laughs> really. Um, yeah. Aside from, you know, a Fathom Events type thing where a film is getting a, a, a national theatrical chain digital one week re-release and it means we can't have access to it for a certain period of time which was not new that's not a new thing that's always been the case sure um, other than that we just pick movies we want to show and do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know well that's that's kind of our move i think the uh the idea of us following our hearts and leaning into our tastes and trying to please as many people as possible has worked really well for us and uh we don't plan to change that anytime soon you know Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack.
Uh, well, this has been so much fun, guys. I'll tell you, it's been a little while since uh, we've been able to get in front of the mics, but we have a ton of stuff planned for you guys, including some videos. The videos are coming. Uh, so we have a lot of great stuff uh, coming down the pipeline. Again, MahoningDIT.com, the socials, where you can get all the ticks, the deets, all that good stuff. And I guess until next time, I'm Virgil signing off. I'm Mark. And on that note, Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field. And most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night and God bless you. <laughs>